Hey, today I thought I would uh, walk through my current stack when it comes to designing, building, and launching new websites uh, here in 2019. And I expect this will go into 2020 and probably beyond, you know, because I just spent the past couple of weeks really overhauling and changing up all of the different tools that I've been using um, when it comes to doing this work. You know, because for many years I've been using WordPress as the CMS, the content management system for all of my sites um, and all the different tools associated with that. And I just felt like it was time to move on. You know, I wanted to get into using uh, more static site generators and, um, and really just being able to um, have my hands on the actual code base underneath every part of the site. Um, whereas WordPress, while I was building custom sites every time, there was all this extra bloat in there. And so uh, last week I launched my new website, BrianCastle.com. Um, this is the first version of it that is not on WordPress in probably over 10 years. Um, so uh, so here's here's what that looks like. So this is all finished and launched and I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. And the next site that I'm uh, now working on this week is the new marketing website for Process Kit. This, this will be at processkit.com, not even close to, to being finished yet, but uh, I have started it and I'm using the same stack for both of these and probably all the, the sites that I create going forward. So why don't we start even before we get to code, just the, the design side of things. Now for briancastle.com, I actually did not design it um, anywhere except for in the browser itself. I, I already had like a pretty clear idea on um, on how I wanted the layout to work. And then I just sort of like worked with the fonts and, and the and, and the colors and things a little bit um, in the browser. I didn't, you know, use any design software, but but for Process Kit, uh, which has, you know, a lot of these custom illustrations and there's a lot more to this page that I haven't built out yet, um, I did use Sketch. So Sketch is definitely my go-to tool for any sort of like very detailed design layouts for, for websites or for uh, user interfaces and, and apps and whatnot. Um, uh, this is the mock-up that I had um, created and, and I created all these graphics here in Sketch itself. Um, and so this week what I'm working on is basically converting this into a functional site. From time to time I'll still use uh, Balsamic mock-ups which is really great for just lo-fi wireframes, um, you know, quick ideas. It doesn't have to be super detailed. That's that's where I would reach for balsamic. But when I needed to get into very detailed um, designs, I'll, I'll use Sketch for that. So once uh, so once the, the Sketch mock-up is done, the next place that I go to would be, uh, I guess I'll show you Sublime Text. Sublime is my um, code editor of choice. And, uh, you know, really uh, another one of my goals with all of this here, by the way, is, is that I wanted to align the way that I create websites as closely to how I um, build apps these days. And I've been using like Ruby on Rails and, and a bunch of other tools related to that tech stack. I'm not really talking so much about that here, but I just wanted to mention that I'm trying to pull as, as much from that world into how I actually create my marketing websites. And so, you know, I, Sublime is my go-to um, text editor of choice. Um, yeah, Sublime is, is it. Uh, in terms of the static site generator, I ended up using Jekyll. And um, this is, you know, a really well-known, uh, not one of the newer ones, but it's it's kind of been around a while. You know, this is what they call a static site generator. And, and when I was first, you know, looking into it and, and kind of comparing different different ones of these, because there's so many of them these days. When I Honestly, when I looked at the site and I hadn't used Jekyll before, I just, it looked outdated to me. And that's what sort of like turned me off about it at first. Um, but as I read more into it, you know, I was really looking for something that is Ruby based because I'm now, you know, developing apps with uh, Ruby on Rails. Um, I also heavily looked into Middleman because that's kind of the other, the other platform that is Ruby based. It's actually very similar to Jekyll. Um, but yeah, I just kind of went with Jekyll because it, it seemed to work well. It seemed to, to be a good option as my first step into this world of building sites using a static site generator. Uh, I did briefly look at some other ones like Gatsby and and Hugo and and others, but um, yeah, Jekyll, I, you know, I got it got it up and running um, pretty easily, and uh, and yeah, I'm I'm pretty happy with it so far. And and so just you know, in, I'm not going to do a whole tutorial here, but uh, the the basic idea is that you know I'm building my site. So so this is the project for the process kit uh, marketing site that I'm working on right now. This folder, SRC for source. These are these are kind of like the working files for the website that I'm 
that I'm generating. And then when I, when Jekyll kind of generates the public site, it, it all goes into this site folder. And this is actually what gets rendered um, to the website. That's a very basic overview. Um, so uh, from there, uh, I guess, by the way, I'll just also mention that I have created a little private GitHub repo that I call Jekyll template. And I, I built into it all of the different tools, which I'll show you uh, com coming up next here, um, into this one project so that I don't have to install all these different dependencies and configure them every single time I, I launch a new site. Um, it's still pretty bare bones because as I said, like I've only basically built two websites with this new stack so far, and I'm sure I'll continue to uh, add on to my new site template, if you will. Um, but it's got the key components and I'm gonna you know, continue to walk through those here. So, um, so this is basically my, my personal template site. And, and when I start up a new site now, I basically just clone this repo. Um, when it comes to forms, I'm using uh, my, my friend Derek Reimer's uh, new product called statickit.com. It's pretty cool. It, it's, uh, it just makes it easy to create any kind of forms that you need on your website. But in the past, when I was using WordPress, I was uh, a long, long time user of Gravity Forms, and I probably still recommend that. There, there are other you know, really great forms plugins out there as well for, for WordPress. But now that I'm not on WordPress, I needed something really flexible and really easy for me to drop in forms on my sites. And so for example, on BrianCastle.com, this, this email opt-in form, um, my contact form, which is here, th these are all powered by uh, static kit. The nice thing is that you can actually build the form as you want it from scratch, you know, putting in the actual input fields and everything. But then it, it has like a on success response, little JavaScript snippet that, that you can, you know, manage what happens after somebody uh, submits the form. And those entries actually get logged here in your static kit account. It's got a great Zapier integration, which I use to, uh, to, to send those emails into my email marketing software and, and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, that's that's a really great little tool, especially if you're obviously this is for like modern forms for static sites, so it's perfect. The next thing that I am using these days is Tailwind CSS. I am a I'll say that I'm a recent convert, <laughs> and I was I was actually talking to to Adam Wathen earlier, saying how it it did take me a little while to come around <laughs> when it when it comes to uh, to Tailwind CSS because it is a very very different. Um, concept for writing CSS code. And, uh, you know, the, in, in a nutshell, you're basically adding all these little utility classes as they call them into your, uh, markup and CSS that took me a long time to get comfortable with. Now that I've used Talon on a few different projects, uh, I, I can see how it's actually a lot easier to, to build, but also to maintain a really complex, um, application or, or user interface. Um, I'm still kind of trying to work through my preferred workflow and format for it. I'll, I'll show you real quick here. Like one of the things that, that always sort of bothered me with Tailwind was that, you know, a lot of these components, you know, let me look at my, um, header navigation. So like a lot of these components have a lot of classes to make them work. You know, what I'm, the, the markup that I'm looking at here is just the top navigation bar on the new process kit site. So, so the logo and this navigation and these buttons, this top line, that's what I'm looking at here. And this is responsive. So, um, so if it collapses down, I've got this um, drop down menu. And so all of that is built using all these different utility classes. And the way that I started organizing my code here is to have like the mobile first classes first, and then have the responsive breakpoints each on their own line. I found that's a little bit easier for me to visually organize, you know, what's going on in the CSS. Um, and and I also started like dropping every uh, every attribute for each tag onto its own line and trying to keep them in line, um, rather than having like super long, you know, long lines. I don't I don't really do code wrapping. Um, so this, this really helps. Um, so that's just a personal preference. I don't know if others who are using Tailwind do it, do it differently, but, um, I found that's a little bit easier for me to, to visually see what's going on in, in the design, but I love how Tailwind, you know, combines the, uh, 
the, the your CSS and your styling with the actual markup and structure of your site without having to have like a massive um, tree of of CSS code, you know, kind of isolated in its own separate uh, set of files. All right, moving on. Um, so that's Tailwind for JavaScript. Uh, I've been really um, enjoying using Stimulus JS. So that's uh, stimulusjs.org. I have uh, really made an effort to not use jQuery anymore. Um, really just in an effort to kind of push myself to learn uh, more vanilla JavaScript. And and Stimulus kind of makes it easier to insert just little bits of vanilla JavaScript into um, uh, little places on, on the website without using one of these heavy handed big JavaScript frameworks um, or anything like that. Like I'm only using small bits of JavaScript. And this is true on my apps like Process Kit and Sunrise KPI, as well as my website. So for example, I'll show you. So that, that drop down that I just showed you, right? So, so clicking that button and, and dropping it down, that is using a little bit of JavaScript and the, the click action is managed um, and this event of of showing and hiding is managed using stimulus js and what's cool about it what i what i always like about it is like bringing it right back to your html markup right um, and so the way that this is handled is i've got this data controller called top nav and then um where is it data target is is kind of the wrapper for um, the, the navigation links and, and I'm, I'm giving that the target of, you know, show hide me, uh, same with this batch of links over here that also gets the same target. And then this is that icon that you click and it's got this data action. So when you click run top nav toggle, and that is assets, JavaScript controllers. It's, uh, it's, it's like a controller. So, um, so I'm running the toggle action and, uh, and then it, it does its thing to basically toggle the, the class. It, it kind of toggles a couple of classes there. Um, so that's, that's how I'm using stimulus JS or that's one example of it. Um, and whoa, I just realized that button is very big. I need to, I need to fix that on the mobile view. Yeah, so that is how I'm using JavaScript and stimulus JS. All right, so, um, Lastly, let's just talk about fonts and then icons. So fonts for many years and through this day, this hasn't really changed much. I am using Typekit. I will continue to call it Typekit, even though Adobe calls it <laughs> Adobe Fonts now. Um, but yeah, this is uh, like I still type in Typekit to get to this page. They, they redirect it. <laughs> um, so yeah, like all my different projects, all my different sites that I have each get a what they call a web project in uh, Typekit, Adobe Fonts. And um, they've got just a really great selection of high quality fonts. It's it's super affordable. I forgot what it is, but I think I'm paying monthly for it now, but it used to be like $50 a year. You know, basically for each individual project, I'll just pick out one or two fonts and then I can sort of uh, decide like which, uh, which weights that I want to include and it will just pull them right in and then I can call them in my CSS pretty easy. Um, and yeah, again, they've, they've got a really great selection. The way that I actually go about uh, selecting fonts, like what I really love about Adobe fonts is that they've got these like categories and, and you can filter by properties. So, um, you know, I, sometimes I'll, I'll just make sure that I'm looking for something with a certain width and maybe something with a certain X height. Um, I hate it when, when they have these like weird decimal, you know, the numbers on different parts of the baseline there. So I usually select this to make sure that numbers are straight and, it, and it'll filter out the, the list of, of fonts there. Um, and the other thing that I'll do is I'll put, I'll type in the actual headline. And so this is still set to the one when I uh, was building out this site, I was, I was picking out the font for this. What I tend to do these days is try to keep it simple. I'll, I'll usually just try to stick with a single font family for the entire site if I can. So like process kit is one font. It's just I'm I'm just using the font called Usual um, for all of these. I'm using different weights of it, but but it's just one font basically across the entire site. With Brian Castle, I'm using two versions of the same font, I believe. Let me see. So yeah, under for Brian Castle, I'm actually using this font called Ivy Journal, and they have 
both a sans version and the one with with nothing that is uh serif so this is ivy ivy journal serif this is ivy journal sans and and then i've got a few different weights going on that to me it just kind of makes it easier to to find a good uh font pairing rather than getting like super creative or experimental with like matching up two completely different fonts um you know designers that are better than me can probably do a better better job of that but i try to just keep it simple and, and make sure that it looks good so that's how i handle fonts icons i've been using this site called icomoon.io and what this is this is a cool site because it um it's basically like a project management tool just for your icon sets so uh so these are different projects that i have been working on with with these icons and so process kit is, is actually the process kit app Process Kit site is is the site that I've been working on, but if I just pull up the Process Kit app one, I'll, just, I'll load the, I'll load that one because it has more icons in it. If I go to generate font, th these are all of the icons that I have actually pulled into that project. So somewhere in the app, I'm or I'm probably using most of these um, icons that I've that I've picked out and used. And the cool thing about this site is that it lets you it lets me select from all these different icon libraries, right? So the yellow ones are the ones that I have actually hand selected and, and pulled into my batch of, of icons that I'm pulling into this um, project. I'm not, you know, loading in a massive library of icons and, and then only using a few of them. And then, um, and so uh, Zondicons is one of my uh, go-to libraries. Steve Shoger is is the I'm probably pronouncing his name wrong. Sorry, Steve, um, but yeah, he's got this this nice set of icons. It's not super large, so sometimes I'll go to the Icon Moon. Like Icon Moon has their own set of of uh, icons as well, so I'll go to that library as well to get to get a few more options. You can pull in, yeah. You can go to this, um, and j these are like all different font or all different icon designers that have that make their libraries available in the Icomoon like directory, if you will. Some of them are, are for purchase, some of them are free, and you can add them in and then just hand select different icons for each one. And then um, if you have an Icomoon subscription, which is you know very cheap, I forgot what it is. It's, I think I pay quarterly, like 30 bucks or 40 bucks, something like that. So I can like jump back and forth between projects and, and then you know come back to my set of icons. It's a little bit of a pain to um, uh, load load them into the project. Like I have to like download it and then copy the font files into the project and then update the, the Icomoon generated CSS to load them in. Like every time I add a new icon, I kind of have to go through that little process to do that. But ultimately it's a it's just an easier way to manage all the different icons that I'm, that I'm using across all my different projects. Uh, yeah, I think lastly is Netlify. This is my hosting provider for or static sites that I'm that I'm hosting. So I am new to this. Uh, I'm a new customer on on Netlify, but um, yeah, I am using it for Brian Castle, and I will be using it pretty soon on uh, on Process Kit. Uh, back when I was doing all my sites in WordPress, I used to use well, I still I still do use uh, Flywheel Hosting, um, which is now owned by WP Engine, which is funny because I used WP Engine for a long time, then I switched to Flywheel, and then WP Engine bought Flywheel. <laughs> so, But now that I'm using, um, now that I'm doing static sites, I'm using Netlify, I absolutely love it. Just the whole the whole experience of, as a new customer, getting set up and launched on Netlify was so easy. And I love how it is, um, it, what you do is you actually sync it up with your GitHub uh, repository. And every time you push to, to like the master branch, it will push, it will automatically push to your Netlify site. And that, and you know, you'll want to set up a staging branch and a master branch so that you can push to staging without pushing to your live site. Um, but that is just super uh, streamlined because um, you're literally just, just launching from the command line. Yeah, I mean, that's that's about all I have for you right now. Um, if I'm missing anything or if you have any questions about any of the any of the tools that I'm using, any suggestions, any, any things that, anything that you recommend, please don't try to recommend like I change, you know, from from Jekyll or something like that, because I spent a lot of time just getting up and running on that. But um, any little tools and tips, I'm, I'm always uh, open to hearing them. Uh, so, yeah, thanks for watching.